going to get right into Revelation, and I have to give you a warning tonight. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Oh, four of you are. Let me give you a warning. This is, this is a, the, the title tonight is Islam Exposed, and it's part five, as you will see in a moment, I'll tell you where you're at. But I want to give you a disclaimer for tonight's study. And let me just tell you this so that you know going in. Tonight, I will de delve into some complicated world issues. This will not be an easy study to follow. Now, why would I tell you that? Because the world, things are happening in the world, and most of us don't understand any of it that's happening in the world with Islam. And so it's, 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 it's affecting politics, it's affecting the global scheme of the world, and uh, America is not telling us this. Our churches aren't telling us this. The news media is not telling us this. But we have to see the full implication of what's going on. This, this could possibly be the most insightful message I've ever given on the state of the affairs of America and the world. Secondly, Yes, we will study Islam, but what we find connected to it may surprise you or even su upset some of you. And third, this is a Bible study. And I will give you a Christian application, not in the beginning, but towards the end of the study with a Bible lesson for us. So I'm not going to be able to quote any scripture verses going down the line here until we get to the very end of this lesson. And four, don't even attempt to take notes. I'm going to tell you that right now. Unless you are compelled to do so or you know shorthand. Because I'm going to give you an awful lot of information today. I can't do it without doing this. This is extremely complex. Most people don't understand it. If I told most people, tell me the difference between a Sunni and a Shia, they wouldn't be able to tell you that. And if I told you to ask most people, where does America stand and the government of America on Sunni and Shia, none of them would be able to tell you. Tonight, you will know full well where that stands. I do suggest, however, you're not going to be able to explain this to any of your friends, although you're going to want to. So I suggest that you buy the CDs. I am not... I am not promoting CDs. I'm telling you, this is enough information that can choke 10 horses. But I'm going to go slow. I'm going to start off real slow, and it's going to get a little complicated. And then we're going to get back into it. How many are with me tonight? How many said, I lost you, and you said, I've got to give you some warnings? Here you go. Islam Exposed, Part 5. So, uh, just quick review for those of you who have not been here. What is Islam? You've seen this before. Second largest religion in the world. 1.2 billion Muslims. 20% of the earth population. And growing fast. Began in modern day Saudi Arabia. We'll talk about Saudi Arabia tonight. Based on beliefs on, of Jews and Christians, Abraham was the first important figure. Uh, the belief is in the same God, they say. Single God. Follows the, the teachings of the prophet Muhammad. So, Muhammad said this. That there were revelations given to these prophets down through the ages. The Torah that was given to Moses. Moses was a great prophet. Abraham was a great prophet. Uh, Noah was a great prophet. And then God gave, uh, gave us Jesus, Isa. He was a great prophet. He built on that. He was the next step. And now Muhammad is greater than Jesus because he's the next step. So Christianity, they believe, is sometime place in the middle. Uh, Judaism is someplace on the bottom rung. And Islam is on the top. Unfortunately, they also believe this, that they need to destroy the infidels, either change those Christians or change those Jews or wipe them out. That is the, the whole idea of Islam is to submit. The Muslim means to submit. Statistics we give you this before. 21% of the world's population, 1.2 billion people. World's second largest religion. Uh, it has, in the last 50 years, it grew more than 500%. Over 65 nations in the world are Islamic. Let me remind you that the UN is loaded with Muslims. It is loaded with it. That's why they're so anti-Semitic. Uh, more Muslims in the U.S. than Episcopalians. More Muslims in the U.S. than Methodists. More Muslims in the U.S. than Jews. Uh, built over 1,000 mosques in the U.S. 80% in the last 15 years. Uh, Muslims desire Islam to to be a mainstream religion in the United States, influencing American life and American culture. One last snapshot of Islam. It says this, a mon it's a monotheistic religion, mono, one God, thea, God. A uh, religion started by Muhammad, 7th century AD, that means the 600s. Muhammad claimed to be the greatest of the prophets, including Moses and Jesus, which I just told you. Islam means submission to the will of Allah. Muhammad's revelation occurred over a 23 year period. The Quran, Islam's holy book, means that which is to be read. Members of Islam are called Muslims, those who submit to Allah. Islam involves five doctrines and the five pillars of faith, which we've already gone over. So tonight we will be studying this. Tonight we are at number five, the sects of Islam, S-E-C-T-S, -E the different branches of Islam. Now before I go, I'm going to go, I'm going to start off slow. I told you that. Islam is sweeping planet earth and not everyone who is Islamic has been born Islamic, especially in America. American is Islam is growing, not from people who are born in Islam, but a lot of people are changing their faith. Now, we have a lot of people that are doing this in America, quite a few, as a matter of fact. Uh, I just read your report that, that coincides with this. Uh, um, Christianity has lost 17% of its people, and basically they're funneling themselves into Wicca, they're funneling themselves into Islam. So we have a lot of people who are brought up Christian who are turning uh, to Islam. American Islam is a little bit different. So usually, even in America, we've seen 
people leave their religious roots uh, for some form of Islam. Uh, usually we zero in on the famous, and so tonight I'm going to show you some of the famous. So let me do just that with, a, with, a, with just a few. Anybody know who that is? Malcolm X, Malcolm Little, or his, his Islamic name, Malik El Shabazz. How about this one? Anybody know who that is? Ice Cube. Uh, he's a rapper and an actor. He's Islamic. How about this one? Snoop, boy, you guys are just right on there, aren't you? Snoop Doggy Dog, a rapper. How about this one? Jermaine Jackson. Michael, by the way, he, he conducted part of Michael's funeral, which had Islamic roots. He actually claims that Michael became, an Isla Michael became a Muslim before he died, saying that he spoke the Shahada to him. So these are the things. How about this one? His sister is a Muslim, Janet Jackson. How about this one? Everybody knows this is the most famous Muslim in America. Cassius Clay was his name. He was raised Christian. How about this one? This may surprise you. Mike Tyson, Malik Abdullah Aziz. He's Muslim. We all know the basketball stars. Who is this? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Alcindor. Um, how about this one? Shaquille O'Neal. He's also very high up in the Freemasons and a very, very practicing free, um, Muslim. You may not know this one, but he was a very famous uh, basketball star. Anybody know him? It's Larry Johnson. How about this one? That's, that's Hakeem Halajuan. Allahu Akbar is his name. Uh, seven foot three. Uh, how about this one? Anybody know that? That's Sakara. That's uh, Fareed Sakara. It's the head of CNN International. And how about this one? Anybody know this one? What do you sing? Cat Cats Cats Stevens. That's him. Here he is as an Islamic. His name is Yusuf Islam. By the way, he is one of the most extreme Islamic believers in America. He is a new audio tape obtained by the, G the uh, Jawa Report. Links Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, uh, to radical Muslim clerics and terrorism. And so this is, how about anybody know this lady? She's an actress, Ellen Bernstein. Her name is Hadiya. She is a Sufi uh, Muslim. We'll tell you what that is in a moment. How many of you know who this is? Dr. Oz, he's a Muslim. Mehmet Shanez Oz. And one of the true shocks that most, I told Cheryl this, she said, that can't be. One of the true shocks, anybody know who this is? The voice of American radio. Anybody know who that is? Casey Kasem. Also the voice of Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. He was America's top 40 radio personality. By the way, he was deeply anti-Semitic and he hated America. Voice of American. How many get messed up with that? This is the stuff that we don't know, okay? So, why tell you all this? Well, because most of these people were not born Muslim. Uh, but they were, they were uh, indoctrinated by imams or clerics. All of them have made their pilgrimage to Hajj, one of the five pillars. Every single person I've shown you on here has made their pilgrimage to Hajj, uh, one of the five pillars of Islam. Most of these are what we call Americanized Muslims, not given to any specific sect of Islam. You see, Islam itself is fractured, split down the middle by two main sects. And if you see it, I can show it to you right here. This is, uh, if you can look up here, this is Islam. And you'll see here, this is what? Sunni and Shia. These are the two main sects, Shia and Sunni. We're gonna, these are all the minor sects that come on, under them. See this right here? This is, these are Druze. A Druze is a type of Shia uh, or Shiite. And Druze, by the way, Casey Kasem was a Druze. It's Islam. Um, we can see that basically what we're seeing down here is, we, here's an Alawat. I'll tell you this later on. That is Bashar al-Assad. He is a Shia. He is an Alawat. And so they have lots of different subsects, but Shia and Sunni are the major ones. Now, you don't get this a lot, but since ISIS came on the, on the, on the scene, most people are confused. We have a war going on in, uh, against ISIS. We have Russia coming in. We have Bashar al-Assad that's there. Hezbollah has joined it. Most of us have no, no, we are so confused. Come on, somebody say your hand. Who's fighting who? Whose side is who on? Well, tonight you're going to find out whose side who's on. Now, whether or not you're going to be able to stay up with it, it's a lot of information. I'm not expecting you to, but I want you to see it. So, uh, they, they split all the way down the line. Again, Bashar al-Assad is the president of Syria. This is the one that everybody wants out right now, uh, that ISIS is trying to defeat. Uh, he is an Alawite. He is a Shiite. 
of the Alawites, Shiite. ISIS is what? They're Sunni. The Sunnis hate the Shia, and the Shia hate the Sunnis. Now, please follow me just little by little. These two groups are diametrically opposed to each other, so much so that they will kill each other on sight if they know it. This is, they hate each other more than they hate America, by the way. They hate each other. Now, we're a common enemy to both of them, but just follow it. So we have the president of, of uh, Syria is a Shia through this thing, the Alawite, Al and Sunni is ISIS. ISIS is Sunni. Now, I'm going to show you where America fits in there in a moment. How many are still with me tonight? Oh, good, because I'm going to lose you. All right, you ready? So wait. So they're in a fight to the death in the Middle East, and they really are. It's a Sunni versus Shia. It is a world war in the Middle East. They've been fighting for 1,400 years. They hate each other, and they want to control the landmass of the other. They want to be able to overcome them. Why do you think ISIS is trying to control areas? They're trying to rid the areas of the Shiite population. That's why they're there. They're trying to kill them. Now, just listen as we continue on. It's a struggle that goes way, way back, and I want you to be knowledgeable about it. So what's the problem? What's the difference? Well, first, a little current news. Let me show you where the nations are so you can get this in your head. The dark green nations are Shia controlled. Iran is a Shia nation. If you go lighter green, that has some Shia in it, but it also has some Sunnis. And of course, as you go a little lighter, that's Shia, but Sunnis. And if you go all these other nations, those are Sunni. How many follow that? Now just look at this. So this is the largest Shia population, na populated nation on the planet. Almost 95% Shia is Iran. Iraq is half and half almost. And Azerbaijan is the same way. Yemen has a lot of Shia. But Oman, Saudi Arabia, Palestinian territory, Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, uh, we see those as all Sunni nations. So uh, just follow this map just for a little bit. And let me get you a little bit up to speed. So Iran... If you look at that map, Iran, heavily Shia, right there. Uh, we see that uh, Az uh, Azerbaijan and Iraq, heavy Shia. Azerbaijan and Iraq, Yemen, kind of more, kind of also has Shia. They're light Shia. Sunni, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Oman, you can see it. Look, Turkey, Erdogan, has a mixture of Shia and Sunni. He's got a problem on his hands. And that's one of the reasons why he's not going into this fight right over here. Because which way he goes is going to determine what his people do. And so he is very, very much on the border back and forth. Now, figure, figure this one out. Turkey is an ally of the United States. So is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman. So we have some real interesting things going on in this thing as far as the dem demographics go. Uh, he is why this Turkey's Edwin? He hates ISIS. Why? Because ISIS is Sunni and he is a Shia. Now listen. Yet he wants to move Turkey as into an Islamic country from a democracy. And where is ISIS concentrating their fight? ISIS is Sunni. Okay? Here in Syria, here's where they're concentrating their fight. They want to make this area Sunni. They want to caliphate and they want to control. They're trying to conquer this entire area here. They're going right now in Syria and Iraq. And uh, in Iran, they're going to go to next. If they ever got any, if they get any foothold here, they're moving right here. They're trying to conquer the area and make the entire Muslim population Sunni. They want to take control of those areas: Syria, Turkey, all of Iraq. If successful, they will move into heavily Shia-occupied Iraq. Ali Khomeini, current supreme leader of Iraq, is a Shia. Uh, he is hated by ISIS. Hassan Rouhani, the seventh president of Iraq is a Shia, hated by ISIS. Hezbollah, who most of the times we think is a terrorist organization against Israel, and this has a radical background, they occupy Lebanon, are Shia, or Shiite. They are fighting against ISIS. It's kind of weird. They're fighting against the Sunnis and are on the side of Bashar al-Assad. Now, how many are getting there? Yeah. Yeah, I, listen, Hamas, which is also a terrorist nation against Israel, is a Sunni nation. Hezbollah is Shiite. Hamas is Sunni. So they don't get along with each other, even though their common enemy is Israel. So Al-Qaeda was Sunni, like ISIS is. Just listen. But here's where it gets really confusing. No doubt you've heard this statement, the enemy of my enemy is still my enemy. Whether Shia, which is Iran, 
who captured and held hostage, hostage, uh, held hostage Americans in the 1970s, whose president, past president Mohammad Ahmadinejad, or Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini, or Hezbollah in Lebanon or Syria, who are Shia, whether it's Sunni or Shia, Sunni is ISIS also, Hamas and Al-Qaeda, Sunni are ISIS, Hamas, and Al-Qaeda, either Sunni or Shiites, or Shia, all of them hate Israel. They call them the little Satan. Listen, let me just get to you again. This is why it gets so confusing for Americans, because we don't know. So let me back up. Sunni, ISIS is Sunni. That's the one I want you to hear. Everybody say ISIS is Sunni. ISIS, is Sunni. ISIS hates Shiites. <laughs> Sunni are all over here. Look. They hate anybody that's in here that's Shia. So they're conquering through this area. So we have Hezbollah, which is also in Lebanon, which is Sunni. They're on the side of ISIS. Hamas, which is in the Gaza Strip, is not. That's Shia. So we have some factions back and forth. This is why it's so confusing to Americans. I'm going to get you even more involved in it in a moment. Just, I just want you to remember this. Al-Qaeda, Al -Qaeda, Hezbollah. Let me even throw out Hezbollah. Al-Qaeda, oh, uh, Osama bin Laden, ISIS are all Sunni. So those are the big major players that have been fighting in America, have they not? Shia really haven't. They, they captured our, uh, some 276 p uh, people in Iran and then they let them go. In Iraq and then they let them go back in the 70s. But we haven't really fought them a whole lot. Uh, we haven't done anything with them. We've, we've really seen the ones against us have been Sunnis. Have they not? How many are following that? Okay, yeah. just forget everything else and just listen. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Osama bin Laden, Sunni. How many would say that's the enemy of America? Well, you are going to be very, very surprised at what I'm going to tell you. So, all of them, all of them hate Israel because all of these Muslims hate Israel and America. All nine, listen to this. Now, remember I told you America is pretty much in a fight with Sunni nations, are they not? I mean, really, Iraq has, has fallen. We've taken that down. So, we're really much in a fight with, with, with Sunni nations. Listen, all nine of the 9-11 terrorists were Sunni. Osama bin Laden was Sunni. They all originated in Saudi Arabia. Now watch the politics. Here's where America, Americans just don't get it. Iran, the largest Shia nation on planet Earth. Ayatollah Khomeini, Ayatollah Khamenei, Mohammad Ahmadinejad, Hassan Rouhani, the first her presidents. Um, yet American politics actually favor the Sunni nations. I told you, ISIS is Sunni. I told you, Osama bin Laden is Sunni. I told you, Saudi Arabia is Sunni. But American politics favor the Sunni nations. Now, how many of you are scratching your heads a little bit right now? Why are we doing that? Now, listen. Okay, I'm sorry, but here's the facts. The Saudis, which are all Sunnis, pay billions, with a B, of dollars in U.S. elections to the American candidates. And they financially back many of the U.S. politicians on both sides. Hence, the United States stands with them and disregards their radical ideologies. They also influence U.S. politics and the political ideas about Shia Muslims in Iran. Now, I've always told you to follow the money, and that's really what you need to follow today. So here's the rub. Three of America's allies are funding ISIS right now. Kuwait, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. All Sunnis. They're funding ISIS. ISIS wouldn't, be in, wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for those nations, and they are our allies. Come on. How many are learning a little bit tonight? Okay, now watch. And recently in the news was the Clinton Foundation. So let me tell you what Wolf Blitzer is not going to tell you. That doesn't have the guts to tell you. $25 million came from Saudi Arabia in 2008 to the Clinton Foundation. In an election year. Other nations that supported her? Sunni nations. Kuwait, Qatar, Brunei, and Oman. Oman about 20, 20 million. And listen to this. From Sunni sheiks. The Clinton Foundation has received so far $100 million. She's bought and she's paid for by Sunnis. The same ones she's telling us. Why do you think she will not tell, talk about radical Islam? Because they're Sunnis. How many of you are getting this now? No, you're not getting it. This should be a light bulb busting all over your head. How many are getting this now? Why do you think Obama is not talking about radical Islam? Because they're Sunnis. They're not going to go against the ones that pad their pockets. Why do you think we haven't put troops on the ground? Why do you think we haven't viciously attacked them? Why do you think we've allowed Russia to come in? Come on, how many with me? Because the Sunnis 
are paying our politics and our politicians. Now, I am sorry to blow your mind about America. I love America, but America has some rotten practices, especially in politics. How many are with me tonight? How many of you got what I just said? Yeah. All right, good, because we're going to go a little bit further. It's not just her. And I don't want to bust your bubble tonight, but I want to give you the facts. Can I do that? Yeah. John McCain got $2 million from the Sunnis for his presidential bid. George W. Bush was in cahoots, I could put it that way, when his, when his oil, when his oil uh, ventures started to fail, he appealed to the Osama bin Laden family, who hooked them up with their Saudi banker, who took one of the biggest guys in Saudi Arabia, most affluent guys in Saudi Arabia, and they, bundled, they bailed him out of his oil problems. I'm telling you, politics is extremely corrupt. How many are with me tonight? Now, I'm not telling you you shouldn't like George Bush. Listen, I would favor one po politician over another, but don't be naive. American politics have a lot of money involved in it on both sides. So, what I can say is this. Let me quote Walter Scott, who wrote Ivanhoe, by the way. Uh, here's what he said. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. And I'll tell you, it's happening all over the place. So, the Sunni, Shia division, has affected the entire planet, including the United States policies. The reason why we have a protracted war there, by the way, I don't know if anybody knows this history, but we supported Osama bin Laden when he went into Afghanistan. How many remember that? We gave him, we gave him ar arms, weapons, and we gave him, and we gave him money to, to rid, rid Afghanistan of the Russians and any Shia that were there. And what did he do after the Russians left and they killed all the Shia? They turned our weapons on us. Because they hate us more, as much as they hate them, or a little bit less. Once they get rid of their enemies, they concentrate on the other enemy. How many are with me tonight? Listen, you can follow this up anywhere you want. You're gonna, I promise you, you're going to find the same things. So, what's their difference? What's the difference between Sunni and Shia? Why is the whole world entangled in this thing? Well, they hate each other. Why do they hate each other? It's complex, but let me try to simplify it for you a little bit tonight. And again, I'm trying to, I told you, this is going to be complex. How many are still with me, though? How many are still with me? How many of I lose in the hallway somewhere? All right. Look, here's Shia, here's Sunni. ISIS, the, the little part of Iraq, Iraq that's there. They both believe there's only one God, Allah, religiously. The Quran is both their holy books. And they both practice the five pillars of, of, uh, of Islam. Shia, they believe only the descendants of Muhammad can be caliphs or, le or lead them. Sunni, caliphs don't have to be descendants of Muhammad. That is such a big difference that they will kill each other over it. Because who leads this caliphate has to be either they have to be related to Muhammad or they don't. And so basically that one point, and there's others, but that one point is a major difference for them that allow them to kill each other over it. If I go a little bit further, I can give you this. Uh, Sunnis believe that the first four caliphs were, were rightly guided. Shia believed that Ali, the prophet's son-in-law, should have succeeded Muhammad. Sunnis believe that Muslim rulers should follow the Sunnah or Muhammad's example. But Shia believe that the, all Muslim rulers should be descendants from Muhammad, do not recognize the authority of the Sunnah. Sunnis believe that claim that the Shia have distorted the meaning of the various passages in the Quran. And we know that the Shias believe the opposite. They believe that the Sunnis have corrupted it. Look at here. Sunni is almost 83% of Muslims on the planet. Shia are 16%. That's why I so is Sunni is trying to rid these Shia of the, of the entire world. They want, a pure, they want a pure Islam that's only Sunni. And we have supported that down through our policies. How many are with me? It's really sad. Now it's come back to bite us. So listen. This... I'm going to give you, I was going to give you another complex thing, but I don't think you can handle that tonight, so let me give you this one. This is a, it's a current po uh, poster that's, that's running all over the Middle East. Shias are not Muslims. They're showing the Shias do not represent Islam. Shias are the enemies of Islam and Muslims. May Allah punish them. This is the, these are the Shia. These are the ones that I showed you back in, back in here. These are the ones that are over here in, uh, in uh, Iran. That's, the, that's where, the, where the Ayatollahs are, that, oh, that picture I just showed you. They're in Iran. They lead Iran. And the Sunnis, ISIS is saying, they are not even godly. They are, they are apostates. We need to kill every one of them. So, whew. Now let me give you a little bit another twist. But not all Muslims are radicalized. This chart shows that uh, 
in these specific countries are more accepting of Shias. So we have this, this division, but some of them are not as radical as others. We know that in Iraq, we have, it says the Shias are Muslims and Shias are not Muslims. We know that Iraq has a, a split in its population. Morocco has a split. They're not saying that same thing as the radicals are saying. They're not, not every Muslim is against Shias and Sunnis. Uh, they're not against the opposite tribe, but the radicals are, and the ones that are leading politics in America are. So why? Because not all the Muslims are, are radical fundamentalists, just like not all who, who call themselves Christians are born again. Somebody say amen. Again, let me return to our current news. When ISIS, which is Sunni, when ISIS takes over an area, this is ISIS coming through this area. This is where they are in Syria. ISIS in Syria and Iraq. This is ISIS. They're going into these areas and they're looking to make these areas pure, Shi pure Sunni. They want to get, they want to rid these areas, this whole area, of any Shia. Shia are spread out in these areas, and they want to rid it. Once they do that, then they'll go into the heavily controlled areas of Shia over in here. They're, this is their first, their first start. The reason why President Obama calls them ISIL is because ISIL claims to have power over the, the, uh, the people over here in Iran, in Iraq, and all, in Iran, and they also claim to have power over Israel. So he's giving them more than they're worth, but the Sunnis... All right, this ISIS is trying to take control. This is where they are. Now, how many of you understand this basic, simple map that they're trying to get rid of the Shia? How many understand that? So that area, they're going to get rid of the, of the Shia. Now, listen well, okay? As soon as they get into an area that they conquer, they search out Christians at first, they imprison them, they torture them, or they kill them or force them to leave. Because obviously, Christians are not going to add to the Muslim population. How many you understand this? They want pure Islam. Then they ask four questions of the rest of the Muslims that are left, because you can't tell one Muslim from another. So they ask four questions. To find out if they're Shia, the first question they ask this is this. After they find out, they're gonna kill them. First question they ask is this. They release the Sunnis, once they find out who they are, and they torture and kill every single Shia they come across. That's those graves I told you about today. I'm bringing all of the history of this in together. How many of you are seeing it? Even in the news. These are the graves they found. These are Shia graves. These are, these are Shia Muslims that look just like the Sunnis that they killed just because they're Shia. So, first question they ask them is this. What is your name? If their name has Ali, Hussein, Hassan, or Abbas in it, they kill them immediately. Because those are the ones that are, that are looking at those successors of Muhammad that were named that. Then they ask them how they pray. I showed you their poses last week. Uh, their Sunnis, ISIS, prays folding their hands or crossing their arms in front, of their, in front of their stomachs. Shias leave them extended and the palms resting on their thighs. So if they tell them that they put their palms on their thighs, they kill them immediately. Uh, in a chilling video that appeared to have been made more than a year ago in the Anwar province in Iraq, ISIS fighters stopped three truck drivers in the desert and asked them whether they were Sunni or Shia. All three claimed to be Sunni. Of course they would because they didn't want to be killed. Then the question got harder. They were asked how they performed each of their prayers, morning, midday, and evening. The truck drivers disagreed on their methods and every single one of them were shot. Third, they asked what kind of music they listened to. Even the ringtone of a, of a person's phone could be a tip-off. You see, Sunni... And Shia religious songs are easy to tell apart. They have different beats. I've been in the Middle East long enough to know when a song comes on the radio that, that is in Arabic, I could tell whether it's Sunni or Shia. And they'll, so they'll ask them that. Four, they look at their hands and the jewelry, if not taken off quickly. Shias wear large rings, often with large semi-precious stones. Sunnis don't wear any rings. So if they have any rings on their hands, they kill them immediately. This, is, this doesn't sound like a... Does this sound like a religion to you? Or does it sound like an execution squad? Or a geopolitical movement determined to overpower the world? So how can I tie this to a Christian message tonight? Well, I thought about this and I thought, you know, I don't like talking about Islam. I don't. There's people listening to me tonight, today that are Muslims. I'm telling you, you find yourself on one side or another of Islam, whether you're a Shia or you're a, or you're a Sunni. And by the way, if you are a Shia Muslim today and you're listening to me, you are considered an infidel by the Sunnis. They don't even believe you believe in God. And so it's pretty amazing, and they will kill you on sight. You have to question yourself, what kind of a religion would have that section of it on that way? You don't see that in Christianity. You have sex and you have different things in Christianity, but you don't see them killing each other. Uh, it's not a, a widespread panic we kill. So as a matter of fact, if they did that, they wouldn't be Christians at all. So how can I tie this thing to a Christian message tonight? Well, first off, let me say that Christianity also has many divisions. And that unlike Islam, though, and what people don't know, is that many of those those uh, that have uh, the same fundamental beliefs have uh, been coming back together, been healing. 
These are some of the main differences in, in Christianity. We know the great schism. There's Protestantism, which is right there. Fear the Christianity. Everybody was Christians. And then we saw these splits come out. But look at this. These are unions. These are healings. Reformed Christianity through the Council of Chaldea. We see these unions happen. Oriental Orthodox and Eastern, Eastern churches. We see the Anglican church and the Western church. So churches are coming together. And these are ones with similar beliefs. So it's not a matter of, of killing everybody that disbelieves with you. But they're actually trying to, with the same doctrines, come together. And unity of the faith has always been the goal of real Christianity. Not unity of different doctrines, but unity of the faith. Catholicism and Protestantism vary differently. They, they should never be united, but there's a lot of Protestant sects that have the same thing in common. Let me give you an example. The Assemblies of God and the Church of God are virtually indistinguishable. The only reason they separate is because one man got mad at somebody, somebody else. Let me say amen. Or they got some doctrine. So those things will eventually heal, hopefully. Jesus' longest sermon was given in John chapter 17. It's also his longest prayer. Right before he went to Calvary. I want to read the entire chapter tonight as we close in, a, in a, I don't know, an hour and a half. As, uh, as we study Jesus' desire for those he was leaving behind. Now listen, if you're, again, if you're a Muslim and you're listening to this on the YouTube, listen to what Jesus, your prophet, one of your prophets said, and see if it lines up with what Muhammad and Shia and Sunni Islam says. Just remember, Muhammad says he's built on the words of Jesus. He believes Jesus is the Messiah. Muhammad believes that Jesus is coming back. Isa is coming back. And uh, let me just tell you this, that he actually believes that you should listen to the words of Jesus. He has said that in the Quran. Listen to the words of Moses. Listen to the words of Abraham. So I want every Muslim that's listening tonight to listen to what Jesus said, and you tell me how that fits into Islamic, into Islamic uh, teachings. Still with me tonight? Yeah. Then Je was, th these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son. Now remind you, Jesus calls himself the son of God. Islam doesn't believe he is. That thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Muhammad cannot give you eternal life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one, the only true God, monotheism, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. The work was to die for mankind. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The pre-existence of Jesus proves the Trinity. Jesus always was God. He was not just he was not created in a Bethlehem. He came down, left his throne in glory. I have manifested thy name to the men which you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things things whatsoever thou hast given me are, are, of thee, are of you. For I have given unto them the words which thou gave me, and they have received them. They have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, as you continue on in Jesus' longest prayer, he says this, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Jesus is not praying for the world tonight. Uh, but for them which thou hast given me, for they're thine. And all mine are thine. That includes me and you. And thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. You and I are still in the world. Listen, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. That is God's, that's Jesus' prayer for the church tonight, for you and for me, that we would be one. The Greek word there is the word E-N, N, that we would be one substance, one body, that we'd be together. It's this, he's not about schisms. Jesus isn't about dividing. He's not about splits. He's not about anything like that. He's about a oneness. Come on, somebody say amen. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that is Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He goes on this say this, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. You and I are citizens of heaven. You are not citizens of planet earth only. You are bound for heaven to rule and reign as priests and kings with God forever. Jesus says this, it says, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world. Jesus isn't praying, take them out of the evil world. He's saying this, but thou you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He goes on and he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. It's God's plan A. You and I are studying scripture tonight and we're studying about Islam because our commission is to go into the world and to make disciples. Our commission is to tell people about this great gift that God has given us than to give it to others. Come on, are you with me tonight? And uh, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Look at 
at verse 20. In your Bibles, put your name there because Jesus just prayed for you. He says, I'm not only praying for my disciples, I'm praying for every single one that will all believe on me through the world. You know what that says? It says, I'm praying for Mark Carell that will believe on me through this word. Not just my disciples, I'm praying for every single person that will believe on me. Jesus is your advocate. advocate. Muhammad isn't praying for any Muslims today. Muhammad isn't, isn't trying to give any strength to any Muslims today. He's given doctrines and he's given commands, but he's not saying he's praying for us. He's never prayed for any single Muslim. Jesus prays for every single person that's ever come to the word of God. Come on, somebody say amen. It goes on to say this, that they may be one in one as thou, Father, art in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and they, the glory that you gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and as thou hast loved me. That word one is all over this prayer. It goes on and says this, and as he ends it, Father, I will let thou, all, they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. He's asking that God will take us to heaven with him, as he know that he will, that they may behold my glory which has given me, thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. His prayer, Jesus' prayer is that you and I will eyeball heaven. You and I will see the glory of Jesus as his pre-existent form in heaven. Jesus' prayer is that not only would you be kept from the world, but that you would be right and snatched right into heaven, that one day you and I will look at the glory of Jesus forever, and we will see the glory he had from before the world began. And I have declared unto them thy name. I will declare it, and the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Christianity is not a religion of hate. It's not a religion of violence. It's not a religion of division. It's a religion of love. It's a religion of unity. It's a religion of oneness. You and I are one today. You are closer to me than my natural brother if he's not saved. You are, I are one. That's why Jesus said, you can leave father, you can leave mother. You have more in common with me eternally than you have with anybody else on the planet. You and I are supposed to be one in faith, one in hope, one in trust in Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be one body, turning as one. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now, some people say that the main reason Sunnis and Shias disagree is because of, their, of the Muhammad successor. The main difference between the Sunni and Shia, in fact, lies in the interpretation of the rightful succession of leadership after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. The declaration of faith to which the Muslims, all Muslims, are sent is this. I told you, it's the Shahada, which, by the way, in, in Hebrew, they call it the Shama, which is the hero of Israel, the Lord our God is one God. It's borrowed, stolen from, from Leviticus. But here's their, their Shahada. There is no God but Allah, whose prophet is Muhammad. However, the Shiites had an extra phase at the end, and the Sunnis hate it. They say, and Ali is the friend of God, and they hate that. Because the Shiites passionately attest to Ali being the successor to Muhammad, much feuding the division that has been caused in the world of Islam. It may have started that way, but there is so much more involved today. The reason Jesus earnestly prayed to the Father to keep us out of the world is because the world is composed of three elements. Good, evil, and listen to this last one, the love of money. Which the Bible says is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, the love of money. What are we talking about with America? Why has America sold its principles down the drain? Because of money. Why have Sunnis, have Sunnis raised up and killed other Sunnis? Because they had money to be able to do that. It's the love of money. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Because it was the money. It's the love of money. It makes you throw away all your principles if you love money. Look at 1 Timothy. Are you still with me tonight? Look at 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is what's said in 1 Timothy. Let me show you this one. Want to see how people really are? Wait till money is involved. Or maybe it's this one. I am a piece of paper and I control your entire life. Look, your name, you name the government, you name the ideology, you name the religion, you name the person who loves money and, ru and runs on a desire for money alone without godly principles. And I will show you many evils. I'll show you greed, avarice, hatred, division, sellout, strife, violence, even murder. I'll show it to you in families, in politics, in governments, and yes, in religions. You see, whenever a religion or a government or a movement is more concerned with money than their principles and their doctrines, all types of evils follow. 
Does God want us to prosper? You bet he does. This is what the Bible says. Say, save now, I beseech you, O Lord, and beseech thee. Now, send now prosperity. David says, prosper me. And that word prosperity has to do with money, by the way, there. Then we have this. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou may prosper. This is 3 John. And be in health. That means be blessed financially. Be in health even as thy soul prospers. He wants, John's talking about us prospering with money even as your soul prospers. Paul said to the Corinthians, give as God has prospered you. Listen to this. It says this. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. As God has given you money, you lay some aside that there be no gatherings when I come. I don't want any offerings when I come, he's saying. And when I come, what, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality, that's their money, unto Jerusalem. He's collecting money for the Jerusalem church. He's saying as God prospers you, you give money to God's work. That's what he's saying. Listen, America is in trouble today because we have been bought and paid for by foreign powers. And now those powers, corrupted by money, are set on destroying America itself. I appeal to anyone listening tonight who is a Muslim or anyone else, maybe even who is a Christian, do not put your trust in any religion whose primary goal is to influence by money, like Islam, double-faced, or whose primary goal is based on receiving rather than giving. Christianity is not for sale. The Holy Spirit doesn't charge for services. Salvation has no monetary price tag on it. We are freeborn. The price has been paid by Jesus Christ. We're citizens of heaven. The price has already been paid. We are to be one in faith, one in hope, one in God. And as he prospers us, we are to bless others in Jesus' words. It's more blessed, the Bible says, to give than to receive. If the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, then the opposite is also true. Not loving money is the root of all kinds of good. Prosperity, profit, money, dividends, interest are not evil words. They can and are God's blessings. They only become evil when the word love is used with them. Look, our world is messed up today because of the love of money. America, which was founded on great godly principles, is messed up because of greed and because of money. How many times do we have to hear about politicians being on the take? How many times do we have to hear about somebody stealing something from somebody else? How many times do we have to hear about a family member dying and all the children fighting over their possessions? Look, there is nothing wrong with possessions or money, but it's not our top priority in our life. I close with this. Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Luke chapter 12. Possessions only provide temporary happiness. The Bible says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Matthew 6, 33. I was talking to somebody the other day. I'll close with this quick. And they were talking about us being down here, and we were talking about, uh, and I talked to Cheryl about this too, and about how God has blessed us. We really feel God has blessed us, uh, prospered us. And I was talking to somebody, we were talking to Cheryl, as a matter of fact, and we said, you know what? We don't need it. We've had nothing, and we've loved life, and we've loved God. We don't care. And somebody once said to me, well, what would happen if it was all gone? Well, it wouldn't affect me. I would, I would not be crazy having to, having to struggle, but on the same hand, God's taken care of me when I struggled. Amen. Somebody say amen. It didn't affect my happiness or my joy. Amen. And boy, if I'm sucked to the fact of American greed and I, and I have to have something, then I've really missed the purpose of what God's called me for. Amen. Listen, I came from a dirt poor family. I mean, I hate to give you this sob story, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. My mother was the only one that worked. My father was unemployed. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. We lived in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. The Mafia controlled Hazleton, Pennsylvania. My father would not join the Mafia. He was blackballed. So he didn't have a job until about the last four years of his life. My mother had a minimum paying job. She had three children. And I remember sitting in a house, which was on the rail, other side of the railroad tracks. I remember sitting there and having, and having tea. And the tea bag was dipped in my cup, my brother's cup, my sister's cup, and my mother's cup. I remember it. Not once. I remember it a lot. I remember the clothes that I wore were given to me from my uncle who had a little bit more than we did. And I remember the shoes never fit me. And I remember some of them had holes in them. Now that's not a sob story. I'm just telling you, I grew up with absolutely nothing. To have something's great, that's wonderful. But it doesn't float my boat. I left a great paying job to take a church, my first church, where I was getting a minimum pay. My children were, cap my children were able to take, we were able to get food stamps, which I never got. And I subsidized myself to have that church. I sold a house, I had a great job, and I used that money to pay for, my, for me pastoring a church. And let me tell you something what God's done. He's blessed me because of that. He's prospered me because of that. Because the Bible says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be added unto you. America's in trouble today because America has dollar signs in their eyes instead of the sign of Jesus in their eyes.
as I close tonight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things, you name it, shall be added unto you. You know, in American Christianity today, I'm really kind of ticked off, to be honest with you. Because we've taken God, we've made him a cosmic Santa Claus. We've prayed to him so that we can get another $100 in our, in our mailboxes, so we can get this, so we can get that. We're a consumer society, we consume everything we could possibly imagine. Now, there's nothing wrong with having something if you could afford something. Somebody say amen. But I'll tell you what, Americans don't care. They just want to be able to take everything they can. And what's, what's at stake here is our children have watched it and they're leaving the church. It's not pure anymore. The nuns are multiplying because they're watching their parents serve other things other than God. But not you. I'm so excited about you being here. You know why? Because you're taking an extra day off to come and hear about God. And let me tell you something. I'm not tickling anybody's ears tonight. I'm telling you the truth. And you know what the truth will do? It'll set you free. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? And aren't you excited to be here tonight? Yeah. Well, are you sure? Yeah. All right. I so thank God for all of you. I thank Him for your hearts, for wanting to hear the truth. And my heart, I believe that God has spared my life so that I can speak the truth. I may be a dinosaur. <laughs> I may be one of the only ones doing it, but I want to speak the truth. You have, you know, I had a guy come into my office one time. He was very, very fluent in the church. Didn't like the music. As your head's bowed, just listen to this one. Came into my office. He was a big tither, which I didn't know. Somebody else told me because I never looked. Came into the church office, my church office. He says, you need to turn down that music. Forget the fact that he was sending me pictures of radios with, with knobs on them and an arrow putting, turning where the music, where you turn the volume down. Well, you could never, I could never satisfy anybody in that church because it was so huge and the acoustics were so bad. So he came into my office one day and he says, I am the biggest tither in this church. I give this and I give that and I give that and I demand you change that music. Turn it down. And I called him by his name kindly. And I said, let me tell you something. I have more to give you than you'll ever have to give me. I said, I'm not dealing with money today. I'm dealing with spiritual principles that will last forever. And I want you to understand, if you're willing to give that up, then you go right ahead. Got on his knees and cried and asked my forgiveness. We have to have a priority in our life. It's got to be Jesus first and nothing else. Now, I know I'm talking to the choir because I know God has blessed all of us. And I know that you're using, your, you're using those blessings for his glory. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand as I just pray for you. Jesus, I thank you for the pure word. I thank you, Lord God, that every one of us are tempted. Every one of us have a temptation to take the easy way or the, or the quick road or the fast cut. But Lord, the truth is we just keep trotting that same path of Christianity and you will work every single thing out for us. I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, for the people that you brought here. I'm thankful, Lord God, that they've come with open hearts and eager hearts, Lord God, that want the riches of heaven. We can never go wrong with the riches of heaven. They will last forever. I pray a blessing, a prosperity on them, Lord God, that as you bless them, they bless others. Lord, touch them tonight. Touch their families. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you.